This is a short story by Jorge Luis Borges, The Lottery in Babylon, or The Lottery of Babylon, The Babylonian Lottery. Many different translations are available. You can read it in about 10 minutes. There's a couple of versions of it being read on YouTube. I'll link to one that is not terrible. Um, in about 17 minutes, you can listen to it. It's a very accessible story. It's easy. If you're curious about Borges, this would be one you could read and get a taste of him. His themes are present in almost every story. This is one of his earlier ones, one of his... I'd say probably his most, one of his most fertile periods for him and for his other, his circle of writing friends was right around the early 40s, just before World War One, just before World War Two. So this story was published, I believe, in 1940, it appeared in his collection. Uh, it's in a couple of his collections. The first one, uh, the first major one was Ficciones. It's also in um, do, do, do. It was okay. So it's first published in the literary magazine Sewer, which means South, and then that was 1941. Same year was in his collection, The Garden of Forking Paths, which uh, later became combined with another collection into Ficciones, 1944, which was then translated into English. I think it also appears in Labyrinths, uh, which appeared in the 60s. It's one of his most famous stories. This first collection, uh, Ficciones, has two stories that include, that are set in Babylon or some kind of country called Babylon. The other one's more famous. The Babylonian Lottery is, I mean, the, li uh, the Library of Babel is probably one of his most famous stories and one of his most but we're not here to talk about that we're here to talk about the the Bab uh, the lottery in babylon which the form of the story takes uh their structure of the story rather is of a person a traveler who's off a ship he's about to get step onto a ship and he's from this country of babylon this country called babylon i should say i'll get to that in a moment and he's in an inn or something, and he's telling the and he's telling someone, you the reader, about his native country, which he remarks in uh, early in the story that he's never really thought about. He always considered uh, the strange culture he comes from to be completely normal, but now that he's traveling, he realizes it's very strange. So he's telling this stranger about it as much as he knows, and he references, you know, uh, as evidence. He he points to different. Uh, things on his body, like a, a mark and a missing finger and this kind of thing, uh, sort of as corroboration of, of what he's going to say. He's also not an expert. He's, he's telling it, and this is just the way I've heard it. He talks, he mentions his father and says, this is, my, this is what my father told me about the lottery and how it began, and I don't know if it's true or not. You know, it's hard to say. All these things are very deliberately... <clears throat> place there uh, to show you uh, to convey to the reader the this one of Borges' most popular themes which is the concept of infinity and this story is like you know I don't know seven pages long or something uh Plenty of people would have taken the same material and written a, a ten-volume fantasy trilogy about it. You could easily. There's a lot of stuff to mine here. The great thing about Borges is what he'll do in a few pages is just blow your mind. This is one of his early mind-blowing stories. Uh, you might call it a high concept. Now, if you're trying to pitch it to Hollywood or something, where it's just mo it's mostly idea. The the setup is. And the real world circumstances and the story arc, all that kind of stuff is not really what he's interested in. The story has movement. The movement is the information that you're given about his culture. And it has to do with this this um, uh, this country called Babylon, which cannot be literally Babylon that we know from ancient history, which ended, I don't know when, like 
like 500 years before Christ or something, because there's references to things more modern here now. It's a, obviously a traditional society. He's this guy's wearing a cape, uh, you know, a robe or something. Um, he's some kind of merchant or traveling the world on a ship. He mentions. Um, what do you call it? Uh, animal sacrifices in this country, which makes it seem like pre, you know, back biblical times, uh, pre, uh, uh, prehistoric, uh, prehistory times, early civilization times. He also, however, mentions Elio Lampredio, who's a writer from, who I think was born in like four. I looked it up. I can't remember exactly when it was, but the 1400s anyway. So it kind of, it takes place out of time. And that's why I say it's not necessarily the Babylon we know from history. Um, I mean, it's not even meant to suppose that. It's just all setting the mood for his ideas about this lottery in his country, which starts out as a, as a basic lottery, just like what, what we would know about. Um, you know, you buy a ticket for a buck or whatever, wait and they call the numbers and you win or you lose and most people lose however it starts to grow and evolve and it's run by this company called the company um, this is where you get into things uh, we might recognize from you know very similar to Philip K. Dick kind of territory or something like that if you're a fan of Dick um, <coughs> the lottery gets more and more complex they start including more things in it uh, bad things you could win, good things you could win, not just money. Uh, the culture sort of gets built up around it and and the company. Um, it expands and expands and expands and that's where the, uh, the movement of the story comes from. It's just this idea being expanded out and out and out and eventually uh, discussions of infinity, which is a preoccupation of Borges. And it's also very funny, you know, uh, Borges never never uh, hesitates to, to point out the absurdities and the uh, humor and and uh, of, of his thought experiments. And so it's very fun to read. Uh, it's a great one to get into to start with him because you'll get an idea of the kind of stories that he writes best. He was not concerned as a writer with psychological... Um, characterizations and all that. It's probably why he never wrote any novels. You know, he's appreciator of, of traditional mysteries, for example. You know, he likes the Gallery Queen and he likes Agatha Christie and, and different people like that, but never wrote one of those type novels himself because he's more interested in the ideas. And he always felt like, as a writer, it's like, why not? Why don't I just put the idea down? He's like, obviously not a pope from the pope tradition. He's from the quote-unquote literary tradition, meaning he wrote these stories as simply and directly as he could, but he didn't really try and make them, you know, I was going to say entertaining, but they are very entertaining. He didn't try to make them, uh, he didn't try to make, them, he did not try to make them commercial. He had a good job at, at the library, um, the National Library in Buenos Aires in Argentina and you know for many years he worked there as kind of a kind of a make work job and he had he had classes he taught and he was not really concerned with money or making a living as a writer he had a lot of side gigs and things like that where he wrote like he wrote these little capsule reviews for little capsule historical thing uh, discussions for a woman's magazine that would just be like a little uh, one page a description of an ancient poet or something like that. He did a lot of little little pieces. He liked to write short. He liked to write to the point. And most of his stories originally appeared in, uh, you know, in the book form in very very short uh, books. These first the first book that this one and the Library of Babel appeared in along with Tom Akbar Orbis Tertius and the Circular Ruins and some of his mo other most famous stories. Uh, it was probably less than 100 pages. Most of his, uh, you know, he'd come out with a, a new book of short stories once every 5 to 20 years, 
wrote 70 stories in, in his about 80 or 90 year long life. When did he die? Um, and, you know, many, po many poems in between, many, many prose poems. The way to read them, I think, is just like one short one at a time. And just like Infinity itself, um, the length doesn't matter. It's, it's the moment. So when you read a story like this, the Babylon of the Lottery, the Lottery in Babylon, whatever you want to call it, you can sit there, you can spend 10 minutes reading it, and then you can spend the next day or month or whatever thinking about it. Just let your mind go with it. It's like drugs, except uh, uh, no, no bad effects on your body. You can read the story and just think about it and all the possibilities that it lays open to you, and I think you'd really enjoy it. There's, of the three versions I found online, they're probably all illegal. I mean, three versions I found of the readings in English. If you search for this story on YouTube, you're gonna find like a million uh, videos. And since the story's so short, it's hard to tell which ones are analysis by some academic because uh, they're all like 17 minutes long, and then the story itself is like 17 minutes long. There's three versions. The one I'm going to link to has a weird thing in the back of the track, uh, like like you can hear another audio track in the background. However, the other two I could find, one has a really annoying uh, music background put on there for some reason. third one has a rather pompous narrator. This one's kind of basic. I think it's stolen from an early audio, audio book of Labyrinths. Of the first uh, American or the first English language tr translation of Labyrinths. But I'd recommend listening to it and let your mind be blown. Uh, things that reminds me of if you like Philip K. Dick, you're definitely going to like Borges. If you like, yeah, and I, I don't think Dick was influenced by Borges because I don't think uh, Borges' stuff was even known in the United States when Dick would have been forming his ideas as a writer. But there's still a lot of parables. One thing I do think is influenced by this story a lot, I'd be surprised if it wasn't, but I could still be wrong, <coughs> is the movie Dark City, which is probably influenced by Dick as well. But it seems to me very much like Dark City is almost an adaptation, a science fiction adaptation of this fantasy story. Um, let me know what you think of that, if you've seen Dark City, and if you listen to the story. It's a really good movie. It's... Uh, didn't do that well, which is why we haven't got many other good science fiction movies that are based on original concepts since then. I think the guy who made Dark City start later made like iRobot and uh, or one of those uh, Will Smith kind of dopey um, action dumbed down science fiction things. But Dark City is like looks like a movie that was made by somebody who really enjoys and reads written science fiction too. So. I think that's a good parallel. Who else is it like? If you like, uh, like I say, if you like that movie, or if you read this story and you want more like this, then go rent Dark City and then wait a few days and read another Borges story. Read the Library of Babel, which is a story which has got a, a ton of uh, fantastic imagery in it too, a ton of uh, things to think about, about infinity. Um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it there. Anyway, I recommend The Library of Battle at Babel by Jorge Luis Borges.